a pleasure to be before you once again today. If you'd like to follow along, I'd like to pull a text from Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. It says, Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. Now I would like for us to consider that word earnest for the next few moments. Usually when we use the word earnest, we have in mind a serious pleading. There's some urgency behind it. Well, that's not the case with this specific Greek word. Although it's involved, it's dealing with money. If you've ever tried to buy a house and you were serious about it, you had to come up with a small portion of funds for an earnest. And that amount would be put into a third party account where either the seller nor you could have access to it. It's an escrow fund. And it was basically a security deposit saying, I am serious about buying this house. And depending on the terms of the agreement, if you ever decided not to buy that house, the seller would actually be able to take that money. But if you did follow through and you purchased that house, you could either take that cash back or you could apply that sum towards the loan of the house. And that's kind of the idea here that's being used, the earnest of our inheritance the security deposit, the pledge of our inheritance. Now in verse 11, we see that word inheritance, but we also see predestinated. And I'm sure many folks of the denominational world are like, see, he predestinates people. But the predestinated here refers to the inheritance and not the who will be partaking of it. The inheritance itself has been predetermined. And those who obey the will of God will be able to receive that inheritance. But back to 14. says the earnest, that pledge, that security deposit of our inheritance has really been set out by God. Specifically the spirit of promise. We sing a lot of times, even today, about our heavenly mansion. We read and we talk about our treasures that we're supposed to lay up in heaven. Matthew chapter 6, 19 and 20. Well, that's all tied up. It's all tied together. You think about us buying a house. What better house could we ever purchase than that mansion in heaven? But you see, we don't have to front that cost. Spirit through the word has done that for us. That pledge, that promise for us to inherit that inherit, bring in that inheritance, inherit that reward, it's been promised to us. The bill has been paid for us. Well, what is that bill? Well, obviously that's the sacrifice of Jesus that makes it possible. The Christ in whom we've all trusted if we've obeyed the gospel. 11, 12, and 13. 
So if we are obedient to God, not only do we become recipients of this great inheritance, but it says we'll be redeemed to be the praise of His glory. Now in Colossians chapter 2, as we wind this down, the first four verses says, For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. That would even apply to us. We've never seen Paul. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. He is saying that we should be comforted because of the promises that we've been given. God cannot lie. And if He has promised something, He will fulfill that promise. He has already supplied, as it were, the security deposit in our inheritance, our mansion, our heavenly home. He has even supplied the way for us to inhabit that home, and that is strict obedience to His will. Faithfully adhering to His word. And if we are found faithful through our acts, the way we live on this earth, we will obtain. In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This is how we can say the matter of 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17. God's word furnishes us unto every good work. It makes us complete, spiritually perfect. It's not going to do us any good if we never open it. Even if we open it and read it, it's never going to do us any good if we never apply the principles found therein. So as we typically try to do, we want to offer the, the invitation for those who are not Christians. God has promised heaven to those who are faithful to Him. It's only, extend, or it's only going to be accepted by those who are faithful to Him. Those members of the church who live faithfully throughout their, their lives on the earth. Why not accept that promise of the inheritance? But if you are a Christian, but you've not been living as such, why not confess, repent, and pray at this time as we stand and sing and have those sins removed?